Hello, and welcome to another podcast. Today we're going to talk about something that should be near and dear to all of our hearts, and that is hemorrhagic shock. Now you may be thinking, it seems a little bit weird for us to talk about hemorrhagic shock when it is supposed to be our bread and butter, but that is the exact reason why I've chosen to talk about this as part of the trauma series, because despite being something that we discuss a lot, there's still a lot of information to know about hemorrhagic shock, and there may be something in your practice that you may have overlooked that this presentation can give you a fresh perspective on. So today we're going to look at blood, we're going to look at hemorrhage, we're going to look at some classes, and we're going to talk about some management principles around hemorrhagic shock, and what does best practice tell us. So as always, but slightly different this time, we're going to introduce hemorrhagic shock. But instead of talking about the numbers and how deadly it is, because I think we all know that hemorrhagic shock is one of the leading causes of death in trauma, and trauma cases are still up there with the top five mortality cases, and trauma in general causing hemorrhagic shock also has a lot of morbidity casualties as well. So casualties that survive but end up with long-term problems. So just to go over the goals when we talk about hemorrhagic shock is we need to be able to treat hemorrhagic shock as quickly, as effectively as possible to control that source of bleeding and control it as early and definitively as possible. And from there, our next goal, if needed, is to replace blood loss. Okay, so not fluid, but blood loss. In regards to the management of hemorrhagic shock, there has been a huge amount of research and a huge amount of upgrades in practice in the last 15 years. And there is still a lot more to follow. There's a lot of promising things coming through the pipeline. And hopefully, we get to be part of that journey. So as mentioned, this is an ADF Medics bread and butter. Not only is it very important for us to know, but we are also the lead instructors for everybody else in our services when it's got to do with hemorrhage control. To the point that in the army, we have transferred hemorrhage control down to our lowest level clinician being our first aider. Every first aider is trained in quick clot, in tourniquet, in compression bandages, and in the management of hemorrhage. And we've done that for a deliberate reason that we'll discuss when we get to management. Before we get there, we'll just go over the functions of the blood, just to remind everyone and let everyone appreciate how amazing blood is. So blood has three primary functions, that is transportation, regulation, and protection. Now these things don't often get appreciated enough, but in regards to transportation, it is the medium that transports everything. It is the item that is responsible for internal respiration. So the transfer of all the gases in our body that keeps us alive is because of our blood. It also provides all the nutrients that we eat, all the amino acids that go to the cells in order to build and repair things and create hormones. and All these wonderful things is done because of the blood. Once the hormones, endocrine glands, enzymes are created, they also transport that around the body in order to be moved to another target cell. And they're responsible for moving the waste from areas where it's collected all the way to the kidneys or the lungs in order to remove that waste from our body so it doesn't build up to toxic levels. Whilst it's doing that, it is regulating our pH. It is keeping us in a homeostatic balance with our pH. It is the main medium that does that. It regulates our body temperature. If it wasn't for our blood, we would be freezing, and that definitely comes into play when we're dealing with casualties. It is also the primary source that feeds the interstitial space, that feeds the cellular structure. So whilst the intravascular space and the plasma is only very small in compared to the overall circulatory volume of the body, it's actually only eight 0.25% of all the water that's found in the body is found within the vessel. Because of hydrostatic pressure and osmotic draw, it is that fluid that is free-flowing the most. So as the blood flows into the area, 
it's subject to hydrostatic pressure. And it's that hydrostatic pressure that gets pushed out of the capillaries, and it's only the osmotic draw that brings it back in. So the replacement of the interstitial fluid is because of the blood itself. And when we talk about protection, it's also the reservoir for very, very special and fancy substances like white blood cells to help us with phagocytosis, either directly in the blood or as a means of transporting it to an area to go through diapetus, which is the transfer of white blood cells through the interstitial space to actually clean up the area. And it also carries all the water, the electrolytes and the enzymes to create these functions. Bottom line is, is it regulates and supports our entire body and when something goes wrong with our blood it's our entire body that feels the effects moving on from that concept and a concept that i believe gets overlooked too much when we talk about shock is a concept known as microcirculation now i believe intuitively when you learn about shock you understand that when people say as you go through shock, blood gets shunted to areas of importance, like your lungs, your heart, and your brain. I think people in children didn't know that happened, but I don't think they understand how that is actually occurring and what that means for the body when that occurs. Okay, and that is where microcirculation comes in. So a few things we have to know about microcirculation is as blood transfers from the arteries into the arterioles, it moves into an area known as the menta arterioles. And from there, it filters into the capillary bed. Okay, so part of the blood branches off and goes through the capillary bed network before it goes back into the venules to go into the vein to come back to the heart. And it's at this capillary bed where most of the transfer occurs. So we're talking the transfer of fluid, the transfer of oxygen, the transfer of waste, the transfer of nutrients occurs at the capillary bed. The only thing that feeds our cells and keeps us going is capillary beds. We do get a little bit of oxygen transfer from veins because they're thinner than the arteries, but nowhere near as much as a capillary bed. Okay, so these capillaries are everywhere. Capillaries even surround the vessels. So arteries and veins have a network of capillaries surrounding them in order to feed the cells that make up the arteries and the veins. They are everywhere. And these beds is what takes care of all of that nutrient transfer and waste disposal. Now within this capillary network, we have structures known as pre-capillary sphincters. Now every time you talk about vasoconstriction, and every talk, time you talk about vasodilation, what you're really saying is pre-capillary sphincters are turning on and they're turning off. That's what those terms actually mean. So in the event you go through vasoconstriction, so we have less blood flow to the area, it means the pre-capillary sphincters has turned off. They've clamped over. So what happens is, is the arterial blood comes over the meta arterial and goes straight into the venule and bypasses that capillary network. Okay, that's what happens. Now once a shock gets bad enough, then it actually can shut off the meta arterial as well. And that's where you get a shunt vessel that goes straight from an arterial, straight into the main part of the venule to the vein. And it cuts off a whole area as well. Now there are a whole bunch of things that control the pre-capillary sphincters, a whole bunch of things that open it, like heat, acidosis, even things like potassium ions, adenosine, and carbon dioxide. So low levels of carbon dioxide will actually cause the sphincters to constrict, whereas high levels of carbon dioxide will cause them to dilate, as we know. Now, another thing that controls these pre-capillary sphincters and overrules a lot of the local factors, metabolic demand, is the endothelium. So the actual cellular structures within 
the metaarterial and the arterioles that when the pressure gets too low it releases vasoconstricting peptides called endotheliums and that causes the sphincters to constrict and as they constrict it stops the blood flow going through the capillary network and therefore maintains perfusion or return of blood back to the heart because if you had pressure coming down the arteriole and it was very low pressure so if you look at the picture in front of us if it was below that 50 then by the time it got to the capillary network it's probably going to get stagnant it's probably going to be so slow and so low in pressure that it won't actually be able to get through the capillary network to refill the veins on the other side think of it as trying to fill a garden bed and you just put the hose in one corner if you just let it trickle in there it's probably just going to pull in the areas of least resistance and it's not going to get to the other side okay in the absence of that pressure it's not going to do it so the body protects itself by turning these things off the consequence of turning these capillary beds off is every single cell within that capillary network now needs to work anaerobically okay and when you work anaerobically you no longer produce pyruvic acid so it no longer goes into the Krebs cycle and you need to rely on anaerobic energy production which of course creates lactic acid and that lactic acid builds up and you end up with acidosis and the acidosis leads to coagulopathies which in turn can lead to all sorts of problems including hypothermia and worsening the effects of your shock so that is what happens all throughout the body when we turn off these micro circulations now when we start resuscitating people the consequence of giving too much blood or too much pressure to these people despite obviously blowing clots as we've always heard about is increasing the actual pressure within the vessels that can destroy clots that are forming which we could discuss later is it also causes the blood to go through these capillary networks and what that can result in whilst it's the overall goal if it's done in an environment in external of good control then it can cause reperfusion injuries which means all the waste material that's been built up in that area and hasn't been able to circulate around the body that well because of the lack of capillary network blood flow all of a sudden get rushed in by diffusion high concentration low concentration movement and all of that waste product comes into the body at once which can cause vasodilation so cause more sphincters to open up which can cause a compounding loss in perfusion to the brain and the vital organs as well as obviously a bunch of other chemicals that can affect rhythms and things like that okay so that's what can happen with our microcirculation now linking that to overall pathophysiology of hemorrhagic shock is it has to start with a decrease in perfusion now there's arguments around whether it's a decreased cardiac output or a decreased arterial pressure or a decreased systemic blood flow okay those three are interchangeable but they all occur when the other one occurs okay I think we can all agree on that so when that situation occurs we have a few things happening in the body systemically linking back to that microcirculation is a decrease in cardiac nutrition there's not enough pressure for it to feed its own heart there's not enough pressure to feed the nutrients to the tissue as we just spoke about and there's also a reduction in that movement which links into our Valcal's triad stagnant blood causing coagulopathy causing clots and those clots can return through the veins causing more problems as well as the decrease in nutrients increases and the amount of tissues that are affected increases then we start getting an effect on different areas that causes greater complications down the road so tissue ischemia occurs everywhere where we have this microcirculation precapillary sphincter contraction occurring okay so that can be everywhere and as we just spoke about with the reperfusion injuries that can cause an increased 
in toxin release, including lactic acid. On top of that, we can also have a decrease in nutrients going to the brain. And when it goes to the brain, we actually end up losing control of our vasomotor activity, which in turn causes vasodilation. So as we progress through shock, we go through stages of compensation where we can hold on, we can survive a little while with microcirculations turned off, but then the more time we're in that state of microcirculation gone, and therefore building up a toxins, lack of perfusion to vital tissue, eventually we're going to move into decompensation. The body can only hold on so long. You can only sprint for so long until you have to stop. The problem the body's in now is it can't stop. So it needs to decompensate. It needs to take drastic measures. And what ends up happening is these fail safes fail. Okay, the floodgates get open literally, which increases capillary permeability, okay, which causes a whole amount of blood pooling and a huge decrease in blood volume further than we already had which in turn just compounds the original issue of decreased arterial pressure, decreased cardiac output, and systemic blood flow. Now this doesn't happen quickly, and there's no real way to measure how long it's gonna take for an individual to go through the stages of compensatory shock into decompensatory shock, okay? Because it is varied on individuals and obviously trauma status that they're in. What has occurred is they have created classes in order to help define where people are at in these stages of compensation versus decompensation. And it was ATLS that came up with the classes and they're still quite unanimously used throughout a lot of practices. And it does link to clinical features. And the good news is, is we can use these clinical features to help inform us of new metrics and things that we should use for shock. So, Traditionally, there's four classes of hemorrhagic shock. Now, there has been a fifth one invented by other organizations, but they're the ones that are generally dealing with high-end surgery. And class five is when people are exsanguinated. They are completely in traumatic cardiac arrest, and they put them into that class five category, just to let you know. But as we move up from class one through to four, it's based on the amount of blood that is lost. Now, you should never get into the habit of using fluid volume as a metric of blood loss and always percentage. When you're dealing with adults, a general rule of thumb is you have between 65 and 70 mils of blood per kilo. Okay, now babies have around 90 mils of blood per kilo because babies need a higher concentration of blood than their mother in order to create that concentration gradient to be fed, okay? But I digress. So 70 mils of blood per kilo. When you lose up to 15% of that, you have what's known as class one. And as you can see in class one, the vital signs appear relatively normal. And you can actually get a small increase in your systolic blood pressure because of that initial shunting that is occurring. Okay, you're turning off certain areas starting to go into the start of shock so therefore your blood pressure can increase there's not a lot that we have to do and the physical signs are very minimal slight anxiousness is a real stretch at this stage too a lot of people don't actually realize that they're in this state but just to put it in perspective this is about three units of blood that you give traditionally in, in hospitals that's how much they've lost Okay, so it doesn't seem like a lot, but it's definitely something to start investigating and don't let them get any worse. As you move into class two, you start to move up to that 30% blood loss. I want you to take a real close look at the OBS. Okay, and the OBS in particular is I want you to take a look at our rest rate, our pulse rate, pulse pressures, which translates to radial pulse, and our blood pressure. Okay, the Metrics that have changed from class one to class two includes tachycardia, so slight tachycardia, and respirate. 
Okay, that's the real one that you do. Now there is an ability, if you're really good and you know what the original pulse felt like, is you can feel a slight reduction in pulse pressures in class two, okay? But it is very difficult and it does not have a high success rate. So it's really the respiratory rate and the pulse rate that increase. Now this isn't surprising for anybody who exercises. The first thing that increases as you start to exercise is your rest rate. It's nice and easy in order to get more oxygen in. And then your heart rate increases, classic signs of compensation. Now patients in this state can start to get mild anxiety. So the anxiousness does increase. This does link into something known as mental status, which we will discuss later. Okay, but that starts to form around class two to class three. So as you move from the higher ends of class two, so 30%, into the 40% range, then you move into class three. And this is where the compensation tends to decrease. Okay, so you tend to get a reduction in compensation around class three, around 40% of your blood loss initially. This is where you actually will get an increase in tachycardia, increase in rest rate, more compensation, then you will get a decrease in pulse pressures, definitely, and you finally will get a decrease in blood pressure. So that happens late. And this is at the stage where people are getting to that decompensation state. So based on that alone, a blood pressure is a horrible metric to use when you're dealing with hemorrhagic shock. Okay, it's the most varied. And if you want to increase the variables, throwing a number out there like 90 or 100 is again completely varied to the individual okay whilst heart rate generally is less effective unless you're dealing with elite athletes that have a resting heart rate of 40 a blood pressure in someone varies greatly so what is 90 for me may be not the same feelings for 90 for you okay or someone smaller than you so it's not a very good metric in general to generalize. And looking at the shock states, it's a very late sign of a decrease before you should start giving blood or fluid resuscitation in general. Whereas if we use other metrics, we can start to get people a little bit earlier and keep them out of that shock state. Because it is that state between high twos and threes, moving into four, that people start to decompensate. And when they decompensate, they fail fluid challenge, so they don't actually respond to fluid resuscitation. Their urinary output is pretty much gone, and they start moving into a coma. So they move from lethargy into the coma state. I don't mean passed out, but they really get that loss of mental status at that class four. It's very difficult to resuscitate someone in the field at a class four. Difficult to resuscitate someone at a class three. You want to try to keep them in the class two realm with your resuscitation. So that is the general goal, which is why we use and we tend to use certain metrics in, in early resuscitation goals in order to keep them in a certain shock state that is conducive to perfusing their brain and keeping them out of decompensation. So let's get into management and let's talk management. General management is no surprise, okay? but what might be a surprise to people that are starting out is general management is not your game. Okay? General management should have nothing to do with you at all. Your goal in general management is to educate everybody else in, in service very well. So by the time you get there, by the time that patient gets to you, this person has a fighting chance. That is your real goal. So when you're educating, we need to be very clear about certain things. Okay, we absolutely need to be very, very clear. Bleeding must be stopped fast. Okay, that's why we put it right at the top with catastrophic hemorrhage. Okay, it has to be done. A cat needs to be applied, so a combat application tourniquet needs to be applied before they get to you, well before they get to you. Now you check it, obviously, because it moves on to further practice, but you definitely check it, but it needs to be put on 
well before it gets to you. Everybody's trained in bandaging and everybody's trained in using quick clot. So if you're with a casualty and you have these advanced things that need to be done, don't forget to use the first aiders and don't forget to encourage the CFAs to use the first aiders to do these basic managements so they can move on to other things in order to complete the primary survey and complete the management of hemorrhagic shock concurrently and faster than doing it for themselves. The only exception is, is let them leave the wound below the tourniquet so then by the time they get to the point of reduction or conversion, it can be done without having to take another dressing off. When you're putting in quick clot, quick clot has to be directly attached to the wound, the bleeding site of the wound. Okay, The quick clot gauze has to touch the bleeding site in order to be effective. If you put it in a pool of blood, by the time it gets to the bleeding site, it's probably not going to be effective. So sometimes you'll need to clear the blood out and then work on getting the quick clot down at the actual site and you want to pack that wound as much as you can. You want to pack it with so much quick clot gauze that you have about two to three centimeters of gauze sticking out of the wound by the time you've finished for you to put good pressure on. Now if it fails, if it gets completely blood soaked, okay so you look at it and there's just blood pooling around it, it's no longer effective, don't just shove another one in. Okay, get rid of that one completely Shove another one in its place, but this time try to work harder at getting it onto that wound itself, directly onto the bleeding site, and then pack around it. Junctional tourniquets are great. The junctional tourniquets are something that we can put on, okay, not our counterparts, okay, and it takes time. And you should never put a junctional tourniquet on your first call if it's going to take you a long time and packing a wound can be done by you or somebody else. Okay, so get someone to pack the wound whilst you get the junctional tourniquet ready because it does take time and it is difficult to put on, regardless of how good you think you are. Patients vary all the time and getting that direct arterial spot that you need for the junctional tourniquet can be difficult. It can take a bit of a maneuvering to get it done. Okay, so just keep that in mind. When we use pelvic binders, we need to put them on everyone that's suspected of a pelvic fracture. Okay, and that's the same for our CFAs. That's our general management. We want to control as much bleeding as we physically can. Long bones, junctional wounds, extremities, we want to control them all, keep as much blood as we can in the human body in order to keep them in that compensatory state. When you get the point that you have a bit of time to breathe, all the life-saving managements have been done, patient's in a pretty good state, then we can start looking at things like reduction and conversion. Now make no mistake, when you're teaching first aiders, you're teaching CFAs, when you're in the initial stages of putting a tourniquet on, do not want first aiders to overthink. Tourniquets are put on high, tight, and horizontal on every bleed when they see blood on the clothes. They see blood on the clothes, they put a tourniquet on. Okay? Even if it ends up that that blood came from someone's nose and they, and they put a tourniquet on the leg because there was blood all over the leg, I don't care. I actually do not care at all, and I would prefer that mandrolic zombie mentality of our first aiders just to put tourniquets on okay because we can remove it okay? there is nothing worse than talking to first aiders and hearing the varied ideas they have about putting tourniquets on and how to put tourniquets on and where to put tourniquets it should be one way every time no questions asked that's the answer that's the goal that we need to get to when we're teaching people to put tourniquets on. Because then when we get to the point that we can do reduction or conversion, then we can make a clinical decision of whether to reduce the tourniquet or convert the tourniquet. So there's no direct time that is to occur, but it's not an emergency-based management. It needs to be done ideally before two hours. Okay, That's 
what everyone knows. If you're doing it between two and six hours, it's best to do in a treatment facility or a resuscitation bay in order to protect the management of those reperfusion injuries that I spoke about. A lot of toxins get built up under a tourniquet, which basically like releasing weight off a crush syndrome, okay, or someone having bad compartment syndrome. It's the same pathology that occurs when we're dealing with tourniquets at that stage. If it's over six hours, then it's done in, in theatres. They're intubated, they're ready to resuscitate them regardless of what comes up. But on the ground, our decision is a little bit more simple. So every tourniquet needs to be reduced. And what reduced means is it means it's taken from a place that is high and tight and it is put 5 to 7.5 or a hand width above the highest wound on the leg. Now the reason I specify highest wound is what sometimes happens, and it can be a bit of a trap, particularly with blast, is as we're cutting pants away and we're having a look, particularly with the legs, we can start to find large bleeds down low that was the initial source. And then up around where the tourniquet is, there can be small puncture wounds. That if we don't look for those and we don't notate where they are, we can inadvertently move the tourniquet down, stop the lower bleed, but then do nothing for the higher bleed. And then we obviously have a problem later on down the road. Okay, now this is true even when we remove the first tourniquet. Okay, there's been cases that wounds have been directly under that tourniquet when they've been placed. And after reduction is done, a larger wound above is found, and you either need to choose whether or not it needs a tourniquet or whether you can pack it and control it with quick clot and dressings. Okay, but getting back to reduction, every single tourniquet is reduced because we want to minimize the amount of tissue that goes through that buildup of toxins. So we want to minimize the amount of ischemia. We want to minimize the amount of toxins that get built up because eventually that tourniquet will be released. Okay, even in the event that amputation occurs, it will still be released. So we want to minimize the amount of toxins that are going to come into the body. Okay, so that's the no-brainer. The way we do it is we keep the original one on, we cut as much of the clothing away from the area, and we place the second tourniquet in position directly on the skin. We tighten the second tourniquet to the point that it's working as a tourniquet. Then we slowly release the first tourniquet, okay? And we watch for signs of bleeding. If we get signs of bleeding, don't just tighten the top one straight away. Try to tighten your new one. See if that works. If that fails, then you can go back and you can tighten the top one and you can try another position, another tourniquet, and another method. If it continues to fail, then you move on and you just leave it in place and just write down that you tried to reduce but were unsuccessful. Conversion is a little bit different. Okay, conversion is our goal is to remove the tourniquet and use just quick clot and dressings or just dressings depending on the wound. Okay, so this is where we assess the wound and we look at it and we decide that can be controlled with quick clot and dressings. Okay, that doesn't need a tourniquet is the decision that we make. So best way to achieve this is to start with your reduction tourniquet, place it into a position that it is not tightened, but ready to be tightened. And then you pack the wound, you dress the wound as though you would, the tourniquet wasn't there, and you release the highest tourniquet. In the event blood comes through the dressing and the actual dressing has failed, then we can attempt to tighten the new tourniquet that is at the reduction level, therefore achieving the goal of reduction. Okay, once that is done, then we remove the original tourniquets and we check the area surrounding the tourniquets and we continue to monitor that converted site for the rest of the treatment of the individuals. Because as you increase fluid, or as you increase blood products or whatever you're giving to them, the viscosity of blood is perfect for the vessels 
So it's also perfect at increasing the intravascular pressure. Now, sometimes that can result in clots being blown off. Okay, now there is no amount of TXA that is going to be able to withstand internal pressure of the vessels. Okay, so sometimes by resuscitating people, you can actually make the wound that was once treated start bleeding again. If that happens, you immediately apply a tourniquet and go through the process again, but you usually leave it as a reduction tourniquet from that point on. Speaking of fluids, we'll have a bit of a chat about fluids. Now, it is no secret, and I'm sure no one's surprised, that giving crystalloids to bleeding patients is bad news. Okay? It pretty much encourages the diamond of death. Okay? It, especially normal saline, okay? it cools the patient down because you're giving cold fluids. And even in the event you're giving warm fluids, you're increasing perfusion. If you're causing capillary beds to open and open on areas that are hypothermic. Now, what I mean by that is, is your chest may be sitting around 36 degrees in this resuscitative state. So when you take a core temperature, it's sitting around 36, maybe high 35s. When you take a temperature of the toes that don't have a tourniquet on, it can be down 27 degrees or even as low as 23 degrees which means if you increase the perfusion to those areas, it is going to cool the blood in those areas before it is run back up to the body. Okay, so that will encourage hypothermia. It dilutes the small amount of blood that's already in there, which worsens coagulopathy. Normal saline is high in chloride, so it's high chloride level causes hyperchloremic acidosis and if you're giving Hartman's, it can increase the amount of lactate that is already circulating around the body, causing worsened acidosis as well. And it doesn't contain calcium. So it causes a dilution of the calcium state, worsening hypercalcemia. Okay, so there is nothing good really to become of crystalloids. We only ever give crystalloids if we do not have blood. That's the first rule that we need to be very clear is we only give crystalloids if we don't have bloods. It doesn't often get spoken about, but if bloods are available, crystalloids do not exist in our resuscitation principles with hemorrhagic shock. Okay, the other metric that we use is a weak or absent radial pulse. Now this links nicely with the classes that we spoke about, but the reason weak is put in there because obviously if you first walk up to a patient, you can't really quantify their pulse as weak if you don't know what their original pulse was it's put in there because as you first take a patient's pulse if it progressively gets weaker that can be a sign if it's absent that's definite sign of shock and that's your trigger for fluid resuscitation the other one is altered mental status now this can cause some confusion because it's not causing altered consciousness it's not saying anything that is like that is saying altered mental status and this gets quite confusing for some people so to break down what altered mental status is it's quite annoying because it is very non-specific changes in the baseline of someone's awareness cognition attention or consciousness okay so consciousness is a nice easy one we have gcs we have avpu so anything that there's a reduction from a definitely but GCS can be a little bit more tricky because technically the term confusion is often thrown around in other cases when it's got to do with mental status as well. Now, 14 is not exactly the metric of someone in hemorrhagic shock to the point of lack of brain perfusion. Okay, so understand where it does get confusing. So you can work with below 13 for a GCS is definite, but more specifically, and the language that should maybe be adopted when we're looking at altered mental status is the term delirium and now delirium is obviously something that's used in chronic conditions but it is the most specific descriptor for an acute or fluctuating altered mental status okay it's easy to characterize it by the decline in attention in cognitive deficits or an altered level of arousal 
Okay, so if there's a decline in someone paying attention, someone understanding what you're saying or that cognitive deficit and that lack of arousal, so almost sedation score, then they are very good signs of an altered mental status. And it's easy to articulate what's going on. So both an altered mental status and delirium, they serve as very important characteristics but themselves are not a diagnosis, obviously. We're just looking for a symptom that results from a lack of perfusion to the higher functioning areas of the brain. And it's that lack of perfusion that causes this altered mental status. So when we have these two metrics, they are the most sensitive and the ones recommended to give fluids, preferably blood, in hemorrhagic shock. That's what we should be using from now on. We should not be using blood pressure as a metric for hemorrhagic shock, or even hypervolemic shock. It should be these two. They're the first ones that you will see that are specific enough in trauma, and they also align with principles of permissive hypertension especially in the point of injury management, which is where you need to focus our attention first. Now, when we're giving fluids or bloods, we give them in 250 ml lots. Okay, that's what we give them in. And the reason for that is what I spoke about before. If you increase the pressure too much, too great, if it's fluid, it's gonna be detrimental. But even if it's blood, because of its perfect nature to be within the vessel, it can cause clots to blow out, and it can cause those reperfusion injuries from overperfusing someone too rapidly. So we stop giving the fluids when someone's mental status improves, or we get a radial pulse present or stronger, or a systolic blood pressure of over 100. And that may sound weird when I just said blood pressure was the worst thing to use, but the reason it's put in here to stop fluid resuscitation as opposed to start fluid resuscitation is in the event somebody has a head injury. They're going to have a cognitive decline. Okay, so that's going to happen. You may not know about that cognitive decline, therefore you may not know about the mental status improvement and you want to stop fluid resuscitation. You may also have trouble getting the pulse. Okay, for lots and lots of reasons. Anyone who's taken enough pulses knows sometimes it's difficult. Okay, so sometimes the pulse may be hard to find. So if you're doing blood pressures, and as you're going through fluid resuscitation, you haven't found these other two metrics, but the blood pressure is sitting at a systolic of 100, that is your indicator to stop. Okay, you are definitely at the level for perfusion. Okay, so you need to stop, otherwise you run the risk of reperfusion injuries or blowing off clots. Make sense? So that's why it's put in to the stop fluid when category, not start fluid to begin with. When we start talking about blood, and we won't spend too much time talking about blood because there's a lot of work going on in that space. Okay, we need to know that in the presence or the absence of blood, we still give TXA. Okay, if we are giving blood, then we give TXA with the first bag of blood. Okay, we can give it before blood arrives, there's nothing wrong with that. In the absence of blood, we still give our two grams of TXA, either in a 100 ml infusion, which works out to be 240 drops per minute, in case you're interested, or we can put it as a two to three minute push if the environment doesn't allow us to do an infusion. So that's for anybody who needs a blood transfusion and anybody with signs of traumatic brain injury. Okay, when we're choosing blood, there's no argument, blood's amazing, and whole blood is the best. Being in the military, we're quite lucky that whole blood is a possibility for us more than anyone else in Civvy Street. Okay, so walking blood banks is something that we've done for a long time, and we're going to continue to do. Okay, we're also looking at, like the rest of the country, cold store, low titer O blood groups, and pre-screened low titer O blood as well. So on the ground blood. Okay, so there's... Lots of options out there. I honestly believe that keeping our options open is the best way to move forward with blood. Now we can always 
go back to component therapy if we're working in a clinic that has components as opposed to whole blood and the ratio of recommendation is one pack cells one fresh frozen plasma one platelets and then you go again pack cells plasma platelets and you keep going one to one to one okay to combat the lack of calcium and to help the body because calcium is amazing we need to give one gram of calcium after the first bag Okay, so that's 30 mils of calcium glutinate or 10 mils of calcium chloride. And at this stage, our protocols consider fluids the same as bloods. So we use the same metrics, we give the same amounts regardless of what it is. Now, there's more to come. There is a lot more to come in this space. This is just where we're at today in 2024. We all know we want blood. Giving blood close to the... the incident or as far forward as possible is obviously the overall goal but logistics are hard it's not as easy as fluids there's a lot of stepping stones that need to be answered and there's a lot of boxes that need to be ticked before we can start moving blood closer to the point of injury things are happening people are working on it okay we just need to keep trying to be part of that solution of the things to come and other things that are amazing when we're dealing with shock state is the use of lactate. So if you're in a facility that can use an ice stat and you have the ability to take a lactate, always take a lactate when you're dealing with hemorrhagic shock or any type of shock, because it's that lactate value that tells us definitively if somebody's in a shock state. So their metrics and their blood pressures and everything could be fine because we're working with permissive hypertension but all those capillary beds in large areas could still be shut down and they could be resuscitated to the point of compensation. And it's the lactate value that tells us that this state will not last. If it's five and above, they're in shock still, regardless of what you're seeing superficially, internally, they are going to crash. So there's been a lot of research happening lately and hopefully, Sometime soon, we start getting lactate monitors bedside, very similar to our blood glucose monitors. So athletes use it now for specific training. So there's no reason why the science can't be transferred. Okay, but when you're in a facility with the ability to take bloods or iStats, definitely take the lactate, if nothing else. Okay, that brings us to the end of hemorrhagic shock. I hope you got something out of it, something to provoke at least a little bit of thought in this space. I can't emphasize enough that this topic in particular needs to be something that we as military clinicians are all over. Okay? We have to be the masterminds when it's got to do with hemorrhagic shock management in the pre-hospital space. But until next time, take care.